My name is David Lee Summers, and I'm reading from The Falcon and the Goose, which appears in the anthology Grease Monkeys, The Heart and Soul of Dieselpunk. Jack Floyd, lead mechanic of the Rio Grande Southern Railroad, rode in the wrecker car with a work crew on the narrow gauge winding its way through southern Colorado's San Juan Mountains. He had a mess to clean up. A steam locomotive's boiler had exploded. He looked out the window and noticed a gray peak with a rock that resembled a lizard's head, looking skyward as though imploring the heavens for patience. The rock reflected Floyd's mood. The wrecker train slowed as it approached the passenger train dead on the tracks. Once the train came to a stop, Floyd climbed down from the wrecker car and strode forward. Number five one of the most reliable locomotives on the line. It looked as though it had sprouted tentacles through the front, ready to grab someone. When the boiler burst, it shoved pipes and rods through the locomotive's smoke box bulkhead. Fortunately, the engineer and fireman were able to jump clear and only sustained minor injuries. There were just a handful of passengers, and the conductor had led all the people back to a nearby town, Ofer. The crew set to work, laying a temporary track so the wrecker car could get in position to disassemble number five and clear the rails. While they worked, the thrum of diesel engines echoed through the mountain valley. Floyd looked up as a small, sleek airship passed overhead. Gold filigree decorated the gondola, and a painted falcon, proclaiming the airship's name, adorned the superstructure's side. The falcon had clearly started life as an air yacht, but Clint Barstow and Annie Patton had pressed it into service, competing with the railroad. They said they could transport goods and people to the mountain towns faster and in more style than the trains. After all, they didn't have to follow the rough terrain. Mechanic Bob Lane sneered at the air yacht. They say Clint and Annie stole that ship from some cattle baron in Kansas City. The engineer who pulled the wrecker car, Art Scott, jumped to their defense. No one's been able to prove anything. Floyd snorted. He suspected the falcon on the craft's side not only announced the ship's name, but obscured the craft's original markings. Once the temporary track neared completion, Floyd began examining the locomotive's remains. He knelt down and picked up a pressure release valve blown clear in the explosion. He frowned as he tried to turn it, but it wouldn't budge. Careful study revealed a small spot weld, too precise to have been caused by the explosion's heat. He stood, pushed his glasses up his nose, and glared in the direction the Falcon had flown. Pete Jameson, the wrecker crew's fireman, approached and touched his hat brim. Mr. Floyd, we're ready to move the wrecker into place. Then get to it, Floyd snapped. When he saw the shocked look on Jameson's face, he took a deep breath and calmed himself. Sorry, I'm irritated. Number five is beyond repair, and we already have too few locomotives on the line. He held up the valve. If someone wants to compete, they don't have to resort to sabotage. Someone could have got hurt. Jameson's brow furrowed. Who do you think did it? Who would benefit from us losing a locomotive? You think it was Clint and Annie? Who else? Jameson removed his hat and wrung it in his hands. I can't believe they're responsible. They always seem so friendly when I see them, ready with a smile and a laugh. Floyd sneered and thrust the valve into his pocket. Yeah, I bet they're laughing all right. Jameson scrambled off to help the engineer get the wrecker in position, and Floyd shook his head at number five's remains. This was 1933, and no one was building new steam locomotives now that diesels were coming into service. What's more, none of the companies building diesel locomotives wanted to support narrow-gauge rail. Even if they did, the Rio Grande Southern couldn't afford to buy one. Somehow, someway, he had need to solve the problem, or the railroad would lose its postal contract to Clint Barstow and Annie Patton.